Hey, how are you today? This is Josh Patrick, and you're at Cracking the Cash Flow Code. And my guest today is Mark Josephson from castiron.me, which I'll put up on the screen so all you guys can see it who are watching this live. And Mark has a really interesting background. He was the president and CEO of Bitly, which if you don't know what it is, you need to know what it is. It was a great URL shortener, which I've been using for like a zillion years. And he is now working with artisan food manufacturers to help them get word out. And we're going to talk about something that he and I both uh, are near and dear to our heart, which is why you need to start with mission, vision, values, and goals, or at least values, before you start your business. So uh, I'm really curious to see what Mark has to say about this. So let's bring him on and we'll find out. Hey, Mark, how are you today? I'm great, Josh. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So uh, I'm a values freak. I believe that if you're not values led, your business is just kind of going to flounder around, uh, sometimes a little bit better, sometimes a little bit worse. But I'm curious what your point of view on that is. Uh, why do you believe values are the place you need to start with a business? Um, I feel really strongly that you need to have a plan and goals when you're building a business or anything for that matter. And um, the everyone knows that they want to build a big business or a successful business, and they generally know what they want to make or sell or provide, but how you do it and what's important to you along the way and how will you know which decisions to make when there's some hard decisions. And I think with mission, vision, and values give you, gives you that framework to chart your path. Because I guarantee you, like any, anybody who is starting a business or working for themselves or um, trying to get from point A to point B, it's never a straight line. So mission um, helps you set your North Star and your guidance of where you want to get to. And your values help you dis make, make decisions every day. And often they're the most important things that you can decide. So when you work with a company, I mean, you've run some companies, you're running a company right now. How do you go about creating the corporate values? Do they come from your values or do you do a group thing or how do you do that? It's often a combination of both. Um, this is the first company at Cast Iron. Cast Iron is the first company I've actually started myself on my career. I have been hired in to run other people's companies and they, those become more collaborative. At Cast Iron, um, it was really important to me, for example, that we were obsessed and we are obsessed with our customers and that everything we do has to start with helping our customers who are independent food artisans succeed. Our mission is to help underserved, underrepresented, under-resourced, underappreciated entrepreneurs become successful small business owners. That is our mission. And our very first value is our artisans come first. So when without our artisans, we're nothing. So we'll always put them for them first and ask ourselves, is it good for them as we make every decision? And that, as you build a company, is an incredible screening tool for talent and employees and coworkers. If you don't feel that way. If you don't get excited about solving a problem for a customer, if you don't get excited about talking to somebody and interviewing them and understanding what their needs are, then you can't work here. And so when we started the company, we put some values in place and I work with the early team to make sure that it resonated. And um, we talk about them all the time, every day, actually. So be besides customer focus, which I think is a great value, yeah. Uh, what are some of your other values? Sure. Uh, built to last is one um, yeah. that's important. We are building a company that we want to last for generations. We are not looking to be a flash in the pan. We want to be yeah. like a well-made and well-cared for cast iron pan, right? That you can stand the test of time and, and last for my kids and their kids. We want to be a, 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 a we want to make decisions that are not about today or this week or this month or this quarter. Again, this is where you go to the mission and say, our ultimate mission is to help entrepreneurs become successful business owners. 
And that doesn't happen overnight. You have to take the long-term view. And any time in my career I've taken the short-term view, it's been a mistake. Always think long-term. Yeah, I have, um, a great, I have a great clarifying statement for you around that, that value, which is we plan for this business to last for 100 years. We make our decisions based on that. Yes, that's <laughs> right. It, and, and we find ourselves, um, we're a private company, so we don't have to report earnings to the world. And right. we care about revenue. We care about profitability. We care about generating cash flow. Um, and we plan for this business to last a hundred years and we make decisions, um, to that effect. Yeah. One of my favorite questions to ask business owners is if your business was going to be a, be here a hundred years from now, what would you be doing differently today than what you are doing? Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful and really thoughtful question. And I'm, if you're asking me that question today, it's really, I think we're living that because we are investing so much of our time and energy into understanding the needs of our customers and engaging with them. You know, sometimes to the point of not monetizing that yet, but really trying to build a deep and rich understanding of our customers' needs and planning for that hundred year journey to solve it. Um, you make me think of a question that I ask myself when I start a new job or leave a new job, because often when you come into a new role or a new opportunity, there are one, two or three things that are particularly very clear that you know you need to get done. And imagine you're on your last day of the job. Did you get those things done? Because there's a lot of noise along the way, but there's usually some very clear things that need to happen. In the, in the role and in the company. There is a lot of noise. I was having a conversation with another, uh, with a friend of mine yesterday and I was talking about the word that people in business don't use nearly enough. And that word is no. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're sort of wired to say yes all the time. If you say yes too much, you're saying no to the opportunities that you really should be saying yes to because there's no capacity. Yeah, I mean, we're we're a tiny team. We're nine people today, and yeah. we have global ambitions. And you know, we're taking a big a big piece of the pie that we're gunning for. And one of the my personal biggest challenges is embracing the stage that we're in and doing the work at this stage of a very early stage company to rather than my desire and inertia, which wants me to jump ahead to operate in a company at scale. Um, and that requires saying no, often to me. <laughs> so that's, that's a, that's a key learning for sure. Yeah. I often have meetings with myself in the mirror and I say, well, let's take a vote. No. <laughs> My team likes to say no to me. So they're yes. good like that. Well, that's, that's a good thing. Somebody has to. <laughs> yes. So, Mark, what's, do you have other values that you guys also hold dear? We do. Um, another one is feed the soul. Um, yep. I, w w it's so interesting now to see with the great resignation and the shift to working remotely. I, I think that me, what I take from that more broadly is that folks are being much more purposeful about how they spend their time and what they work on. And they want to and I want to, and we want to do things that matter. So we think you, that as a company, we can do well financially, business metrics wise. And we can do that by doing good. We can do well by doing good, by leaving every interaction that we have better um, than, we, than they were when we joined, um, making the planet better, improving um, the economy, macro, micro, um, so we think about how do we do that in a way um, that's consistent with our business goals and lets us feel good about the time and energy we're providing to our jobs. Um, and so Feed the Soul is another very important one. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. It's, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, 
I'm sure you're aware of the technology called Scrum, which is agile planning. Sure. Used in the software world extensively, but not used everywhere else extensively. And it should be, in my opinion. Um, also, Jeff Sutherland's opinion. But he's got three questions he asks at the end of a sprint, which is this two one week period where you're trying to produce something. And the three questions, I think, are just genius questions. I missed them the first time I read the book. I just reread it. And uh, in there it is, at the end of, in the retrospective, at the end of the sprint, we go back and we're reviewing what happened over the last couple of weeks. And at the end of that, he asked everybody on the, on the scrum team, the sprint team, to answer three questions. What gave you joy for the last two weeks? What didn't bring you joy for the last two weeks? And what would have to change for what didn't bring you joy to bringing you joy. I am absolutely convinced the great res resignation is not because people want more money. Mm -hmm. I am absolutely convinced the great resignation is because the people that work with us are finally saying, we want to say. And the thing I love about that particular three questions is it a puts the person on the front line having to have personal responsibility about what will make their life better. Yes. Then it becomes the leaders of that team, the leaders of the company's job to get the junk out of the way so people can enjoy the work. And people yeah. who are happy at work do better work. That's all there is to it. It, it. It's so true. And, you know, I feel really strongly that we have a limited amount of time on this planet and a lot of competing priorities, whether it's your family, um, your, your, you know, your, your hobbies or interests, your job, um, all of those things. And as human beings, we are conditioned to avoid pain and seek pleasure and joy. And you know, if we can get a company to align with um, the team's uh, ambitions, goals, joy, um, triggers, then it's a really good thing. Um, I couldn't agree more. And we run uh, Agile and Scrum. And so we do, we run in two-week sprints as well. So we do retrospectives every two weeks. Yeah. And the, the, to me, you know, <laughs> I tell the story all the time and I finally have got a new, new ending to it. But I used to be in the food service and vending business back um, in my earlier, my first career. And we had all these grass front snack machines and make a long story short, we started our project at $42 per service, ended at $142 per service, $145 per service. And we took our inventory in our warehouse from 125 items down to 14 items. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took us three years to do this. Now, this was when we were using Deming's 14 points as our you know, strategy for you know, quality control. Had we known about, had Scrum even existed then, which it didn't, but had we known about it, instead of three years, it would have taken us three months. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm such a big fan of it. I'm looking at the technologies that we used to do that, which was really pretty interesting back in 1987, to what's available today that people have come up with, you know, and it's all, all this is derivatives off, you know, W. Edwards Deming's work. In my yeah. opinion, in my and, and 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 it's, it's so important to I think to be asking yourself, what are we trying to do? What are we actually trying to do here? And then what did we? What were the results? What did we learn? I'm always asking myself and my team, what are our key learnings here? And then what are we going to do now that we have those learnings? Because things have to change, and it is that rapid iteration. Um, an innovation cycle that drives drives growth. And another another our, we have two more values which I'll share with you. One is think big and move fast. And yep. with the limited amount of time we have, we need to make an effort to go quickly and try new things and move and learn and improve. And the last one is believe. You have to be optimistic. Uh, I think as a human being, particularly if you are um, if you're an entrepreneur. And by the way, I don't think of entrepreneurs just as tech bros on the coasts raising venture capital. There are 65 million people in this country, most of them blue collar, who wake up every day and are entrepreneurial by necessity. They don't necessarily have access to the 
to the corporate jobs or the other jobs that might have been there a generation ago. And I believe our economy is increasingly driven by individual um, entrepreneurship, and that's at the core of our company. And to just bring it back full circle, when I've spoken to our artisans first, customer first, I've spoken to more artisans and customers in the past 16 months than I have in the past 30 years. And the number one motivator for starting a cottage food business is the joy that they get when giving the cookie or the sourdough or the kombucha to their customers and the smile on their face when they taste that wedding cake or Easter cookie, it's joy is the motivator. And yeah. Um, yeah. it's really powerful. Yeah, it, it's, well, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the artisan world because I find it's a really interesting world mm -hmm. in that they're not really building businesses to sell. They're, they're all basically lifestyle businesses. Maybe they can sell it and they get a few bucks for it down the road, but the nature of these businesses, they all pretty much stay pretty small. Um, and I think it's because it sort of fits in with Michael Gerber's, uh, I'm not a huge fan of, of instituting his stuff because it's too complicated for most people, but he has one statement, which I really love, which is uh, entrepreneurs are mostly technicians who had an entrepreneurial cramp. And that's certainly true in the artisan bakery world or the artisan food world is that they're making small batches. You know, I have a, my periodontist daughter is doing uh, uh, not mushrooms, but she's doing, um, she's doing, you know, a, a, a food type that's really easy, you know, marshmallows, artisan right. marshmallows. Mm, now, delicious. yeah, I've never thought about artisan marshmallows yeah. before, but, you know, she's doing it in her kitchen and, you know, eventually she'll move to a, probably a shared kitchen facility of some sort. And maybe if she really gets big, she'll go to a contract kitchen of some sort. Mm -hmm. Probably she'll never build her own food manufacturing facility. No. Uh, and, and a couple of things that I think are really important. One is the perception that you have to build a business to sell for it to be successful. And, and you, don't. You, you don't. don't. And two, that you have to own all of the component pieces of the manufacturing process to be real. Um, technology like cast iron makes it really easy for you to start and run an e-commerce business. And I have, a, I have a personal aversion driven by my professional experience um, to the word lifestyle, lifestyle business. Lifestyle business yeah. to me implies... Oh, how nice. Wouldn't it be great if I could sell some cookies? I'm talking to hundreds of artisans and it's not, oh, this would be so great because it would make my lifestyle nicer. These are jobs. They are working really hard. This is a main source of income. And I think it's a disservice. I know this is, this is just a, a nit that I'm going to probably write a blog post about, but life cycle businesses Lifestyle businesses implies it's not important and it's nice to have when what we're seeing is these are entrepreneurs by necessity. They need them to work real jobs. Yeah, I, I'm not when I say lifestyle business, I'm not being pejorative at all. It's one of the choices that we can make. Yes, and when I true. say lifestyle it means non saleable. OK, that's what lifestyle means. Or, you know, essentially it could be saleable, but it's not going to be significant in allowing you to leave your business. Yeah. And, um, and, and yeah, it's a terrible term. I actually agree. I, you know, a lot of times people call solopreneurs or, you know, micro businesses or, you know, and, and even those are not, you know, especially great terms for it. I love the term artisan business, frankly. Yeah, I think that's too. a really good, I actually start, may start using that for what's considered lifestyle businesses all over the place. And, you know, we actually have, um, you know, come up with what we call the wind down strategy where you do 80, 20 in your business, but mm. it becomes time to leave it. You keep your top 20% of your customers and you let the bottom 80% go and you likely have the same revenue and more profit than you did when you were running your full business. This is especially true in the wealth management world where you have, you know, solo owners of businesses. They don't want to sell their businesses. That's a terrible choice for them mm. because they're not going to get a big amount of dollars at closing. 
it's better to wind your business down. You know, 80, you keep 20% of your clients, you get rid of 80%. You're now working part-time, making more money than you did when you had your full book of business. What's yeah. wrong with that? I've seen that in every business I've run. It's a very long tail of, of customers. And there's usually a uh, that 20% at the top that's driving a ton of action, for sure. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's true all over the place. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a bit about artisan, you know, artisan food business. What is the biggest challenge they face? And we only have a few minutes left. I wish we had sure. more time to delve into this. Um, I'll, I'll summarize it as uh, a lot of our artisans who get into this business, they start because they're gifted um, and really talented at creating a certain product. Um, there, whether those, whatever that might be from hot sauce to meal prep to kombucha and fresh, fresh juices, sourdough, cookies, cakes, you name it. And they're encouraged by their friends and family and their own internal drive to build a business out of it. Fast forward, actually starting running and growing an artisanal food business, they end up spending 75 to 80% of their time on things other than what they thought they would be doing. They are building a website taking orders, man, maintaining a customer list, figuring out inventory, trying to understand pricing, chasing down for payment, all of the things that they, ne that, that they never really intended or wanted to do or were particularly good at. And software and technology can make really easy for them. So that's one of the biggest challenges. There seems to be a, a leap of faith that you need to take to do this business. And you know, we want to provide for them uh, an easy button to get started and get running because th th to address a lot of their pain points. So how are you getting the word out about your business? Because I, I, I love what you guys are doing. And uh, I'm always curious in how, you know, this is like a really diverse group of people. I mean, yeah. is it Instagram that, that they hang out? Where do they hang out? Uh, they are very active in social media, a lot of Facebook um, a lot of uh, next door, a lot of um, searching for advice and support and answers. So we spend a lot of time in search engine marketing, search engine optimization, creating content um, because our artisans are first and because we're built to last for 100 years. Our primary marketing strategy is creating content that answers questions that our customers have. And we want to give them value. I love that. There's a guy named Marcus Buckingham who wrote a book called They Ask, You Tell. Mm. And um, he's one of HubSpot's top agencies. He used to own a pool company. And he put together this 20-minute video about answering all the questions that his customers would have. And he used that as a screening thing to send out salespeople. They had yeah, a watch, a customer had to watch that 20-minute video. And if they did, two things happened. One, they were more invested in getting a pool. And two, they were more informed about what getting a pool means. So a lot of the questions they might have were already answered. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it is true that if you give value to your customers, you will receive value in return. Yeah, that's been my experience. I, you know, everything I tell people, they probably already know anyhow. So <laughs> I just help them remember it. <laughs> that is uh, more than that, I'm sure. Yes. So, Mark, I am. Uh, I, this has been a pleasure speaking with you, but unfortunately, we are out of time. So, how would folks find you and find your company? If you happen to be an artisan food maker of any type, or you're thinking about it, you got to visit Mark's site and learn more about what they do. So, Mark, how do we find you? Thanks. Please come to castiron.me, C A S T I R O N.me, and you can get started in one click in five minutes. Cool. For free. Uh, we like that. <laughs> and I've got two things I want you to do. And this, I think about the 356th time I've asked this, which is wherever you're listening to this podcast, please subscribe. And while you're at it, give us an honest rating review. It's really important for us. The more reviews we get, the more that Apple and Spotify decide we're actually useful and other people might want to listen. And the reviews we've gotten off this podcast, we've been doing it for about seven years now, have been really pretty good. You know, I think we have lots of shows with folks like Mark who are just a pleasure to talk to. Uh, the second thing I have is I write a weekly newsletter. I call it Josh's Musings. It's actually our sustainable business newsletter. And I write about whatever I'm thinking about. Uh, last year, last week was about coming to the center and stop 
looking at the fringes of how we do things and make giant bills, but that's a rarity. Usually I talk about a business problem that you might be thinking about. And it's really easy to get. You just go to www.sustainablebusiness.co forward slash newsletter, and you'll get a chance to sign up for our newsletter. And we send it out every Tuesday morning. You'll have it in your mailbox about nine o'clock. And I love to hear from people. And I actually do respond to all the stuff. So this is Josh Patrick. We're with Mark Josephin. You're at Josephson. We're at Cracking the Cashflow Code. Thanks a lot for stopping by. I hope to see you back here really soon.